Welcome back to In Other Waters. At the end of the last episode, we found the research base down here in the Southern Bloom and got a suit, or at least some upgrades for our suit that will allow us to go far, far into the deep thousands of meters, I think. So we're going to follow Manet's footsteps and just dive off into the deep and see what's there. <laughs> Hope Manet's still alive. Um, however, there's a couple things I want to do first. First thing, we had some other samples that I have not studied, that I've transferred into the sample store, so let's study those. Looks like we got two. What is this? Soothe Spore? Have I really not studied a Soothe Spore? Sample already analyzed. Yeah, I thought so. Why well, didn't it have a cross through it? Weird. was all? Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we have a lot of updates. For the bivalve bloom vein, we have behavior and now a sketch. Behavior. Sampling and analyzing bubble growths from the bloom shows that they are a form of algae, but with incredible adaptability. They have a distinctive chemical structure, but notable to the study of bloom veins is the presence of a compound similar to Domoic acid within bloom bubbles. Domoic acid is a neurotoxin known to produce memory loss and confusion in animals, which suggests that the erratic and frantic feeding behavior of bloom veins when feeding is, in reality, a form of frenzy brought on by the consumption of the neurotoxin. How this process isn't deadly to the bloom veins is unclear. The volumes of neurotoxin they are consuming are vast, enough to kill a human adult. Perhaps if I can directly examine a bloom vein, or at least its shell, I can understand the resistance. Oops, I always do that. Nesting Weavers. Hold on, Nesting Weavers. This is a totally new thing, right? I don't think we've even seen the observation for it. Weavers are creatures found in the bloom where they build elaborate cylindrical nests protected by bubbles of oxygenated water. Iridescent and translucent, weavers themselves are difficult to observe individually due to their size and speed. Each nest is a hive of activity as is the fizzing skin of the bubbles that protect them, which the weavers carefully maintain. If at any point the integrity of that bubble seems to be collapsing, many weavers will rapidly respond, leaving the nest in swarms to rebuild the bubble skin. What is it that the weavers are protecting, and how are they shielding themselves so effectively from the bloom? Analysis of individual weavers might help if we're able to catch some of them. Behavior Analysis of weaver specimens shows them to be shelled creatures with a set of jointed mandibles, which they use to handle their threads. These threads are the most fascinating aspect of the weavers. They're silk, but lined with a type of bacteria which lives inside the mouth parts of the weaver. When the threads are produced, they're coated with this bacteria, which aggressively consumes the microbial growth of the bloom. When not producing silk, this bacteria is kept alive by scavenging on the food that the weavers eat, taking their share from particles stuck on the weavers' mouthparts. However, analysis of the weavers themselves still give no idea of what might lie in their nest. They protect these nests aggressively, but if I could find an abandoned one, it may be possible to sample it. Reef cap. Behavior and a sketch. Soothe spores, the name by which I've come to call the reef caps spores, don't seem to be spores at all. Wait, haven't we read this? I, I feel like we've 
read this. Um, but I, I guess I'll go ahead. Unlike the modified spores of other stalks, these particles don't have any reproductive capacity. Instead, they resemble endospores, dormant bacteria reduced to dried husks. No, we definitely read this. Okay, I'm just going to the sketch. Wait, we saw that sketch too. I'm so confused. Why was this marked as unseen? Weird. Okay. Bloom froth. Oh, this is totally new, so observations. These clusters of opaque green bubbles can be found clinging to surfaces in the quieter areas of the bloom, where currents do not disturb their growth. They appear to be accumulations of the bloom's microbial growth, the green clouds that create this vast toxic cloud of anoxic ocean water. The bloom itself is a mysterious phenomenon, similar to terrestrial algae blooms. Hence the name Manet gave this part of Gliese 667cc's ocean, but far more potent in its strength and seemingly much longer lasting, as much of the life in this sector has adapted to these extreme conditions. The similarity to terrestrial blue-green algae, aka cyanobacteria, has led me to classify this species as bacterial, but this thesis needs to be tested. Perhaps by analyzing this froth, we can understand the underlying chemical processes taking place here. Behavior. Laboratory analysis of the froth has shown that each large bead in the bloom froth is a single microbial colony, bound by a gelatinous film, much like terrestrial cyanobacteria of the order Nostocles. However, unlike this terrestrial species, the bloom froth displays an incredible ability to actively modify their internal chemistry to whatever conditions they find themselves in. Most bloom froth appears to have diverted to consuming metallic compounds, found in unusual abundance in the region of the bloom, rather than sunlight. This has led to the bacteria outputting large volumes of neurotoxins rather than oxygen. It is this which has left the bloom both anoxic and toxic. To understand more, we need to find the source of this destructive bacteria. That's all those new things. I think we also have a new entry. Yes, we do. Personal Log 3 of Ellery Voss. Finding that laboratory in the bloom, it's almost like working with Manet again. I still have some good memories of Kepler 62F. Hours diving beneath the ice in that crystalline ocean, sampling the mineral deposits that Manet claimed were evidence of life. Our synchronized rhythms in the lab, working silently but in concert, lying beside her in the too narrow berth, the creak of pack ice rattling down the base's spine. But those memories come with unwelcome ones attached. Ones of Manet's quiet judgment, her deep sadness, her flaring anger. For a few short months, that subglacial ocean was ours, blocked from the universe outside by five kilometers of ice. Its secrets were our own. But then Manet had other secrets too. It seems like I'll never escape her secrets. Here I am living among them, drowning in them, picking through them in search of answers. Okay, I have something that I want to check. I was going to head straight to the drop-off, under the assumption that we shouldn't go around the bloom because we're not yet immune to the bloom. I'm just hoping and assuming we will become immune to the bloom at some point. But actually, with the suit modifications, maybe we are? They didn't explicitly mention anything about protection from the bloom. Just protection from crushing pressures of the deep. So that's why I think... We probably don't have protection to it, but maybe we do not. Then we're going for a dive. Okay, um, I'm just going to cut out all of my faffing around for like 15 minutes trying to find a way to do uh, to get to this drop off. Uh, you don't get to it. You just use it, and then it confirms the dive to the selected location. Okay. 
Uh, hmm. I thought we had to actually get there. Are you back with me? We're 20 seconds from the ocean floor. Oh, we're that close already? Uh, yes. Good. I was getting lonely in here. We're descending fast. The drop is huge. One and a half kilometers down. Let's stay focused. We have no data on this zone of the ocean. The light of Gliese 667CC's three stars barely make it this deep. Whoa. I've got my headlamps on. You'll have to be my eyes. I want to work my way along the slope to the northeast. We're looking for any trace of Manet or the ROVs she sent down here. Let's get to it. We're on the ocean floor, 1,510 meters deep. By the, uh, actually, I want to check something. Do we have a connection? We do not have a link all the way down here, which makes sense. But that also makes me scared, because I feel trapped here. How easy is it going to be to get back to the surface? Do we just press the up button and then just go up? We can't right now, but I mean, I suppose our craft has that ability, right? The Dusk Slopes. Beyond the reach of the suit's lamps, the slopes descend slowly into the dark, towards the abyssal plain. There's something just so... creepy about the term abyssal plain. It just sounds like such a lonely alien place. Still waters. The heavy currents of the upper ocean don't reach down here, leaving the water still and silent, sediment suspended in the column. Is that a creature? I see it. There's a dot over there. Pale glow. A bioluminescent glow drifts through the silt, a faint but noticeable chemical blue. What is that? That's a creature. Tangled veil. These silken creatures are almost transparent, apart from those lights. What are they? These drifting veils of material appear to be creatures of some kind. They're pulsing faintly with pinpricks of light. Trailing veil. This veil stretches away from the tangle of the group, reaching towards new territories. There's so much of them. They're all over the place. In the headlamps of the suit, I can occasionally see a vein-like texture to the surface of these veils. What substances sustain them? The veils are gathered in groups which I'm calling tangles. They seem to be intentional formations, but for what purpose? Field of veils. Diaphanous veils twitch, suspended in the water. They're seeded with pinpricks of bioluminescence like distorted star fields. Man, this must look so beautiful. An underground star field. The lights the veil produce come directly from beneath their skin. They shift from transparent to light emitting and undulating waves. Veil edge. Though their soft shifting forms can be hard to see, this seems to mark the edge of one of the veils. Whoa, what was that? Oh! It sapped our power to go through them. Interesting. Okay, so we should be a little bit careful.
Though tangled and without any clear sensory organs, these creatures seem to have a strong control over their position in the water. So yeah, let's not go back that way. Let's go this way. And then over. Veil Passage between these two veils, some clear water is visible. A temporary corridor between two hanging sheets. So if they sap our power, what does that mean? Does that mean that's how they sustain themselves? They... Like... I don't know. Sap the power of anything that passes through them? All little particles and creatures? Of course, not everything has power, like electricity, so I, I don't know what that would really mean for something biological. Between veils. A gap between the veils. Is it that these are two competing individuals, or is this just a temporary separation of a single group? Studded along the veils are the remains of creatures that have been confused by the lights and caught by these transparent hunters. Ah, yeah. So their bioluminescence little pinpricks of lights all over the place are to attract creatures that then get stuck in the web and, I guess, drained of life. Veil Edge. Here the tangle is receding. A few of its trailing veils hanging still in the dark water like the poised limbs of a dancer. New Species Snare Veil I'm naming these strange creatures Snare Veils. They're such beautiful traps. Wide, delicate silken panels of bioluminescent cells. They work in unison to entrap and digest creatures which come too close. Light patterns. This veil is blinking the same sequence of lights over and over. Perhaps this is a way of attracting curious prey into their grip. Why didn't Manet tell anyone about this place? The life here, it's the biggest discovery in human history. Do you think she's trying to protect it? Yes. But then why bring me here? Maybe she expects me to keep her secrets too. She always had her secrets. But this feels bigger than that. Dark water. Away from the veils, the water returns to its inky darkness, resisting the strong beams of the suit's lamps. Hmm, okay, I was hoping we would find a way around the veils. Because there's this here. Digesting veil. At closer inspection, these veils... Oh, it's a sample candidate. Well, we need that. These veils are jeweled with a half-digested remain of other remains of other life, passing conveyor-like from one veil to the next. Alright, this is gonna hurt a little bit. Ugh. Digested remains, an unknown creature caught by a veil and partially digested. It would give us a little bit of power. Veil clearing. Surrounded on all sides by drifting sheets of bioluminescence, this space is a fluid, shifting interior. The veil delivered some kind of stunning electrical shock to the suit. Is that how they disable their prey? We should be careful of contact with this species. I know. <laughs> I'm surprised it took you so long to notice. 
Ow. Silt bank. Silt has gathered around the base of two large outcrops, forming a natural respite from the steady downward pitch of the slopes. Layered outcrop. Dark basalt layers rise up out of the slope like fractured towers, each jagged layer carrying drifts of silver silt. Basalt Tower. These dark towers of angular stones are the telltale signs of volcanic processes active under the planet's surface. You know what I just... I just thought of a question that I don't know the answer to and I'm really interested to know the answer to. So Earth obviously has a lot of heat at its core and it has volcanic processes as a result of that. Do all planets or most planets or is that common? Is that like how planets work? I just googled it. I didn't find a direct answer to my question. Is it something that all planets have? Um, but I did find that there's a lot, a lot of planets that we know about that have confirmed volcanic activity. So at the least, it's very common. Somebody, please feel free to uh, chime in if you know anything more about this. ROV debris. Ah. What must be one of Monet's uh, improvised remote vehicles lies twisted in the silt. Could it have been disabled by the veils? This debris. It's one of Monet's ROVs. Wait, to my left, is that? What is it? H human? It's her. Manet? Is she alive? Static body. Oh no. Is that? Oh, God. She's here. She's alive? We're reading life signs and she's breathing. That can't be right. How long has she been here? Lying in the silt. We have to bring her back to the base, but I don't. Okay, focus, Ellery. What do we do? We can use the ROV to boost our signal to the base, send for the drone. Then we can start the ascent. Give me back to the ROV debris and hook us up with the terminal. Okay, we're synced. Call the drone now. We need to get her out of here. How in the hell is she alive? You're back. I... I need to talk. I'm on the medical level. She's totally unresponsive. I don't know what to do. I don't even understand how she's still alive. I keep going back to the image of her. Blue. Silent. Staring out of the silt. A thin stream of bubbles flickering from her mouth. How long had she been there? 
pressure alone should have crushed her at that depth. This doesn't make sense. But she is alive. I need to talk to her, but nothing. I want to understand. I want to know what is going on here. I haven't seen her in years. Not since she left. And now, here she is. Do you ever imagine all the things you're going to say to a person when you see them again? Yeah. I wanted to scream at her. To whisper it to her. To tell her... I came here for her. I don't know why I did, but I did. I think it's because I had to hope. For something to change. For there to be an explanation. For those months we spent together to mean something again. Sorry, I'm not making any sense. This makes twice. Two times she's turned my life upside down. At least this time I knew what I was signing myself up for. It's not like I had anywhere else to be. The further I am from that dying planet, the better. What comes next? We keep going. She was looking for something out here. Something important enough to leave her like this. It's our turn to take that forward. To find that explanation. I think she built that lab in the bloom to study those mineral skeletons. Artificers, she called them. But something was leading her deeper, beyond the drop-off. Let's start with those ROVs she sent out. Maybe they found something we didn't. I'll mark the last known positions on the dive map. And I'll be here until you're ready to go. We have a new entry, personal log number four. She's still alive. I never thought I would see her again. Not after she sliced the core from the base on Kepler-62F and took the shuttle to God knows where. I spent weeks slowly freezing in that base, waiting for the Baikal team to come get me. After that, it all fell apart. There was never any life on Kepler-62F. Mene had faked the whole thing. She wanted the data core she knew Baikal would provide when she gave them evidence of first contact. Baikal blamed me and my work as a consulting biologist collapsed. I limped back to Earth to take a post-grad position on that dying planet. There's little need for marine biologists in a place where the only oceanic life is kept in tourist-choked reserves. That's where I stayed, watching the endless exodus of humans with enough money to leave, looking out across the dead ocean at the pinpricks of their shuttle's rocket flares. Until Monet called me here. I should blame her for everything, but I just want to know why. Perhaps now, if she ever wakes up, I can ask her. Okay, there's a lot here. I thought, like, I, I guess I just assumed that the only thing that had happened between Ellery and Manet is that they had a bad breakup, is what it sounded like, but there's a lot more. So... She faked there being life on Kepler-62F so that Baikal would send in a core that she then stole. She needed the core. Why? What is the core? The data core. She wanted the data core she knew Baikal would provide. Yeah, I don't... I can't even imagine why she would want that. But apparently it was really important so important that she screwed over and, and ruined Ellery's career. Could see why Ellery would be bitter about that, as well as, you know, the outbursts and kind of shitty relationship is what it sounded like also. Uh, we have a new sample.
snare veil. Observation and behavior. Snare veils are unique soft-bodied creatures that resemble a thin sheet of silk studded with lights. Found in tangles of multiple individuals, their hypnotic swaying and flickering lights make them difficult to see in their entirety. But from my initial observations, they appear to be flat panels of bioluminescent cells which are faintly veined with both a nervous and a digestive system. Veils survive by capturing creatures which swim onto their surface, somehow stunning or killing them and then digesting them on the exterior of their bodies. I've also observed veils passing prey from one individual to another, suggesting that they have some form of social interaction between individuals. Analysis of the digested remains they leave behind might give some clues as to their predatory behavior. That is so interesting that they digest the food on the outside of their body. And also passing food to one another. Behavior. Analysis of unknown remains found nearby a veil, a veil tangle, shows that this creature captures and kills its prey through an electrical charge. And this charge, presumably produced by electric organs that sit beneath the veil's outer membranes, can produce incredibly high voltage outputs. And the remains analyzed showed significant damage from these electrical discharges. The remains also suggest that the veils use electrical pulses to control the muscles and nervous systems of captured creatures, forcing them to swim deeper into the grip of the veil when captured. The veil's manipulation of electrical signals seem, seems highly nuanced, and they may also use them for the detection of prey and even communication between individuals. In order to confirm these theories, analysis of veil tissue is necessary, although this may prove difficult. Yeah, I gotta get some veil tissue without getting too shocked, I guess. So what does our dive map look like? Okay, so now we can just go here like any normal place. We can just start from the dusk slopes. Signal, priority. Another one of Monet's improvised ROVs stopped transmitting somewhere here after sending back some strange geological readings. And then another one. I'm starting to get the feeling that we may not get protection from the bloom. We might, but we might not. And it is within my power to get these samples. I can do it. I think I should. If they're listed here on the map already, I probably can just go and get them. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> 